Good day. It is indeed a good day. Good day to be alive. Probably the best day to be alive is the day that you're currently living. That's a profound statement. Yeah. All the days that we've already lived are past. The only one we're guaranteed is the one we're in right now. So let's enjoy it. Let's make it better. Let's tune ourselves up for an increasingly better and brighter life. How do we consistently tune ourselves up for a better and brighter life? Well, one way to do it, I think, is... And if you've been around and alive in the last two decades, you know exactly what those beginning notes mean. It means don't stop believing. Don't stop believing that what you're looking for is in the pipeline. It's coming. Don't stop believing that what the word of God has said is yours. Don't stop believing that what you've been praying for is being answered. Don't stop believing. Believe that the promises are true. There's specifically 7,000 plus different like directive promises in the scripture to us. And those are part of the keys that we've said that, is, that are in this box of keys, the promises. And we believe what it says, not just the promises, but the directives and the principles that as we apply those things to our lives, as we continue to tune ourselves up, and we will all the days of our lives, for the rest of our lives. Even the, when I'm not here talking with you in, in Tune Up TV, you still have the responsibility, the outlandish, amazing privilege to be able to tune yourself up and go forward in your relationship with God. And along the way, don't stop believing. Along the way, hold on to the promises. Sometimes all you have in life is a promise, but a promise is enough because a promise coming from the one who his word, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. The one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises are yes, and they are amen. What does that mean? They are affirmative, and they are so be it, let it happen to me. Yes, please, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, certain, affixed. It is going to occur. That's what the promises of God tell us. So, indeed, let that be in you to think. Just those opening piano chords to think about. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm not gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop believing. I choose to believe. When the temptation is to. <sighs> Give up. Don't stop believing. Believe. The things that produce prosperity that I've been talking to you about, how we create an environment that grows prosperity in our lives, prospering in every area of our lives, including finances, including relationships, including your health. Incl the foundation is to believe. Be lead and to live in that belief. So our tune-up template, I like that, our tune-up template. Our tune-up template has been the wisdom books and Proverbs. And today being the sixth, we look at the sixth proverb to help us to continue to point ourselves in the right direction and stay on that, that particular coordinate. You know that particular coordinate that that specific target when you set a destination in your gps and you want to go to this address 
it will at times encounter slowdowns, you know, and it comes up and says, oh, there's a slowdown here. Do you want to stay on the current route? Press yes to accept or all that sort of, you're, when you set a coordinate, even if there are detours, you keep the coordinate, you keep the target. And to anchor us in our target and for us to, what did we say in our previous session? Keep right. When we decide to keep right, we keep our coordinates. And I like to say this from time to time, I've mentioned it, but for me, it's a, it's a core goal to consider the way that we live that as we mentioned yesterday in Proverbs 521, for a man's ways are in full view of the Lord and he examines all his paths. I want to live for the one who is examining my paths. My ways are in full view of the Lord and he examines all my paths. So I'm living for an audience of one. If we, the, the more simplified we can keep it, the less confused we become along the way. We keep our eyes. He is our number one coordinate. Coordinate. You set your course to follow him. I set my course to follow him, to hear from him. Being reminded daily that my spirit is the candle of the Lord. And I want to shine. So as we've found an incredible template for our tune-ups that are heading us towards life and life more abundantly. We're expecting flowing streams and springs and pools and fountains and wheat and barley and grapevines and fig trees and pomegranates and olive oil and honey, and food that's plentiful and lacking nothing, iron that's common, copper that's abundant. We eat our fill, we're prosperous, we build fine homes, have large flocks and herds, silver and gold and everything multiplies and we remember it is the lord our god who gives us power to create wealth the wealth of experience the wealth of finance the wealth in our relationships the wealth of a prosperous career the wealth of health in our minds the wealth of health in our bodies the wealth of health in interpersonal relationships prospering in every area of our lives more than enough Houses we didn't build, vineyards we didn't plant, olive groves and fruit trees in abundance, taking us to places that maybe have only, you may not have even entertained the idea. But once we start cracking that code in our brains and cracking off those old mindsets that that's for everybody else, well, it's nice to hear how blessed they are, but, you know, I live in the real world. Well, let's step into the blessed world. Why? Because my spirit, your spirit, Gina, Jetta, Nicole, Terry, Jade, Vanessa, Peta, Rob, Jason. Our spirit is the candle of the Lord. We are blessed. What? So we can sit on top of our blessed assurance. <laughs> no, we're blessed to bless others. To be a blessing, to be a channel of distribution and blessing. So that's why we're in this tune up. Proverbs 6. I'm going to read verse 1 to 8. Proverbs 6. Look at it in your Bible with me. Read along. I'm reading from the New International Version old new international version before they updated it and took words out I, uh, anyway my son if you have put up security for your neighbor if you have struck hands and pledge for another if you've been trapped by what you said ensnared by the words of your mouth then do this my son to free yourself since you've fallen into your neighbor's hands go and humble yourself press your plea 
say that. Say, press your plea. Press your plea with your neighbor. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. Like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard. <laughs> that sounds like you're cussing when you say it. You sluggard. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Verses 1 to 8. Hello, Mary. Are what I call responsibility. Not response ability, response ability. Response ability. You might want to write that down. Response ability. That in all that we possess, then all in all of our affairs. Remember, proverbs are the on earth as it is in heaven kind of living. It's teaching us skillful and godly wisdom, that on earth as it is in heaven style of living. It's the art of living. It's us understanding that if we, then he, if I, then they, cause and effect, the if and then kind of kind of thinking. So response ability in every affair of our lives. Okay, remember, again, we are spirits, we have minds, we live in bodies, and then out from there, we have relationships, we have careers, we have finances, and we have the etc. category that includes everything else. Creativity, entrepreneurial endeavors, um, uh, adventure, fun, hobbies, whatever. Okay, so in all those areas, we have responsibility, responsibility. That my response determines my results. That's also cause and effect thinking. My response determines my results. The only thing that I'm in control of at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day is me. I can't control you. You can't control me. You can certainly influence. You can exert influence, but at the end of the day, every single one of the seven plus billion people on the planet have free will and we make our choices. We decide even the people closest to you in your life. They don't control you. Oh, they can certainly exert some manipulative tax tactics. There can be narcissistic tendencies, but I'm at all day long, every day. 24-7, 365 days of the year, you and I have responsibility. So everything that concerns us in our, in our business, in our communication, in our relationships, in our finances, this is telling us, listen, pay very close attention to how you handle your affairs because it will all come back to you. It comes back to you. And we have that personal response ability. We have stewardship. Most often in church circles, when we hear the word stewardship, we think only, uh, you know, oh, it's a stewardship campaign. They're going to, you know, raise money to, to add on a youth wing or whatever the, the case may be. Or being, you know, a tithing stewardship campaign. Yes, that is extraordinarily important how we manage our money that is a main way of life but it's in every area of life stewardship how we handle the affairs of life we have response ability in all of our affairs here's the other thing you can take responsibility and then think you about how i have a response ability the i the the one we're used to the response ability meaning I am responsible for this. And here's an aspect of that, that we don't hear a whole lot about, but is so mind blowingly crucial to the way we live our lives. And that is, we will all be judged 
on our response ability regarding our response abilities. Did you get that? We will all be judged according to our response ability to our responsibilities. How we respond to what is on our plate, what and not just what's on our plate, but what is is in us. What what are we to release into the world? What are what did God design us for before he knit us together in our mother's womb? I mean, it's it's mind boggling to think that in in God's conversation with Jeremiah, he said to him, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So the whole fallacy about where life begins, life begins before you're formed in the womb. So there's that. That he knew you and he knew you and in response to a purpose that he wanted to birth in the earth, he formed you. He knew he knew you and then he formed you together the way you are, you beautiful creature you. And he put all these gifts and talents and abilities and purpose and destiny and ideas straight from the throne room of heaven into you to fulfill. We're not on this planet to take up space. We're on this planet to take over. You're not in your life to be kicked around by life. You're to rule your life. Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. And he made man out of the dust of the earth and he blessed him. Said, be fruitful and multiply, rule the earth and subdue it. Not the other way around. The earth doesn't rule you. You rule. You rule. <laughs> you rock. And when we arrive at the judgment seat of Christ, only those of us who have a relationship with God, we will arrive one day at the judgment seat of Christ. Where it says that all of our works will be piled in front of us as wood, hay, and stubble. All that we've done. All of our works. Yes. And I wonder how big that pile will be. Because if you take Ephesians 2.10 into account, where it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do, hold the phone. All these good works that he prepared in advance for us to do, I think of it this way. There's a warehouse in the heavenlies with your name on it and stacked from floor to infinity are good works that you are to perform and to bring into this planet. And that is yours and yours alone response, ability and ability. Those good works stacked floor to infinity waiting on you that are already prepared. They're already formed. They're there. We just have to consistently put ourselves in agreement with what God has for us. So there will be that day that we all stand before Jesus face to face, eye to eye. And that pile in front of us of good works that appear as wood, hay, and stubble, that as Jesus appears in front of you, it will, because of the because of his presence, it will ignite. And what's left will be the precious stones that go in your crown. <laughs> that if our motives are right, we accept our responsibilities, our, our response, our ability to respond to our responsibilities. And we did what we did. We do what we do now with the motive of understanding, Lord, I do what I do is unto you. I do not want to let one day pass without doing what 
you designed me to do. You designed me to fulfill purpose. You had purpose, destinies, and ideas for, for this planet that you packed into me. And so all of these things we're talking about, if you, you know, uh, the affairs of life, what is our response to what's in front of us? How faithful are we to the heavenly vision that brought us into conception in our mother's womb and then brought into this world? How faithful? What is our response to what's in front of us? To what's in front of us and what's inside of us. And what's inside of us is, oh, hmm. Do we have what it takes? Oh, I don't know. How's infinite intelligence for you? How's that? How's how's infinite ability for you? That that make it a little easier? Yeah, see, the thing is, we are just we are the vessels. We are the ones that that the power comes through, that the knowledge comes through, that we just have to consistently make positive that we are in position to channel God's grace to tune ourselves up, to operate at higher and higher efficiency, higher and higher effectiveness, being responsible for what's in front of us. I know you have dreams in your heart. Are they dreams that align with what God's dream is for you? Because one day we will arrive. And the closest thing to tears in heaven, because there will be no tears in heaven. The closest thing to tears in heaven is to see all that we could have been. Because the scripture lets us know that we we will we will see that. Well, we're all God's children, Randall, and we all inherit. And we, yeah, but there's levels. I highly, highly recommend um, John Bevere's book, Driven by Eternity. In it, he tells. Uh, he does an allegorical thing and and how and the representation of how we land in heaven and the hierarchy of heaven. What? Exactly. Nobody talks about this. Oh, it's all going to be OK. We all sin. Don't worry about it. No. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Response. Ability to our responsibility. It's a little sobering, isn't it? But sobering in a good way. I'm like, listen, I have the ability. The control is the, the balls in, in our court, how we respond to it. You don't have to wait for any religious leader to tell you it's okay. You decide, you know what? I'm gonna do everything that I know to do and more to the best of my ability. Lord, consume me that I may radiate your presence. Consume me, less of me and more of you, less of me and more of you. God has set eternity in the hearts of men, Ecclesiastes 3.11. That drives us on. You are welcome, Gina. This drives us on. Sometimes we don't know what the nagging thing on the inside of us is because maybe we haven't paid attention to it before, but we feel like there's an emptiness and why I'm not quite being fulfilled. It's because we're not following and getting in line with our our responsibility to service to give of our lives to a cause bigger than ourselves if all that consists of our lives is me mine and what are we going to eat today that's a very minimal existence that could also be classified as an animal existence that of all my life exists about well what, what am i going to eat no, he gave us a soul, which elevates us above the animal levels, who all they do is they want to eat, they want to drink, they want to sleep, and they want to procreate. No, if that's all our lives exist up, we're no better than an animal. But it's we have that ability because of our connection to God. Okay, I am here for a reason. Don't discount me. I know that one day I will stare the savior of the universe, 
eye to eye. And I don't I don't want a little pile in front of me. Well, it's selfish and that's prideful. No, it's not. It's responsible. I want I want everything that God designed for me, everything that's in that warehouse. I don't want anything left in that warehouse, so to speak. That's my interpretation. It helps me think about it, that it's stuff already prepared in advance for me to do. I don't have to. Oh, how am I going? No, I just have to be a willing vessel. God gives me the idea and I follow his guidance along the way. Holy Spirit guides me into all truth. And that truth leads me out into a, a spacious place free from restriction to the comfort of his table, laden with choice food and drink, that I am going forward in the good works that he's prepared in advance for me to do. And the outstanding news is that I am his work of art created in Christ Jesus. I have been specifically knit together in my mother's womb to be able to manifest this stuff on the earth. One of the things that I'm manifested to do is what I'm doing right now. In whatever form it takes, I am responsible responsible to communicate the truths of this book and to get it to all who will. And for me to understand it, for me to, to mutterate on it, memorize it, and release it to as many people as will listen, whether it's two or two million. So as we consider our responsibilities and response ability, this gives us, you know, a jump off point there for what we're to do. Look at how it says in verse um, uh, verse. Well, let's read verse two and three. If you've been trapped by what you said, there is a, a, a humongous area of, of the life that we live and our responsibility. If you've been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, I'm not going to go into a teaching on the power of words, but there, that sucker has a mouthful right then and there. Some of the reasons why we're not going forward is because of the things that we've said. What have you gotten in agreement with that are ensnaring you? What have you said out of your mouth? What have you heard that you agreed with that was negative, that's ensnared you? Anyway, going forward, if you've been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, then do this, my son to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Here's the key. Go and humble yourself. Press your plea with your neighbor. Press your plea. I had you say that earlier. Press your plea. What, it, what does that mean? It means persist. It means be persistent. Persistent. I want you to look over with me at Luke chapter 5, where Jesus taught about this very thing. Luke chapter 5. Or, I'm sorry, Luke 11, sorry, verse 5. Luke 11, verse 5. This is right after Jesus uh, gave to the disciples and to us the Lord's Prayer, the most famous prayer of all time, the most powerful prayer, the template for prayer. Luke 11, verse 5, he continues talking. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he's his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. That word boldness is also persistent. In the Amplified Bible, it says, yet because of his shameless persistence and insistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Because of his shameless persistence and insistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Because of his shameless persistence and insistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. What was Jesus saying here? Oh, he may have said something else that you might recognize. Verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will 
be open. Let's read the verse 11 and 12. Which of you, of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Persistence. In the theme of persistence and boldness in in asking this man knocking on the door hey i my friends came into town i didn't know they were coming i didn't go to the grocery store i don't have enough food to feed my friends help me no it's too late go away i'm i'm, I'm already asleep and he keeps knocking keeps knocking keeps knocking keeps asking keeps asking keeps asking so because of his shameless persistence and insistence the man got up and gave him all that he needed and more what is that saying to us press your plea press your plea with the lord press your plea with what you're trying to do press your plea don't take no for an answer if you feel god has guided you in something and you've been pursuing it and you seem to keep meeting resistance Press your plea, press your plea, press your plea. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Decide that no will not be the end. That happened to me recently about a, something that I wanted to do and set up. And I was knocking, 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 knocking. And I heard no, and then I heard no. And I decided I wasn't satisfied with no. So I retooled and went another direction. Same idea, but came about it a little bit different. Well, the answer became yes. That no turned into a yes. Terry's asking, is the resistance because God wants us to go a different route sometimes? The resistance that happens, if it's something that you know in your, your knower that God has called you to do, the resistance may not be because God wants you to go another route. The resistance is because there are people that are anointed by hell to oppose your God-appointed direction there are people that have never done a thing in their lives but they want to make sure that you don't do yours what is that it's demonic and it's the enemy trying to oppose your god-given purpose in this world this 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 world right now the prince of the power of the air in the world is the enemy and he wants to oppress but the fact of the matter is, is that he can't. If you can consistently stick with it, and that's what this whole thing is, this whole proverb, the proverb six, and then the proverb that Jesus just told, the opposition that comes, I promise you, there will always be opposition to your God-appointed mission. That's why we need alignment and realignment for our assignment i know all those things rhyme together but it's and it helps remember there will be opposition to our mission but you don't take no for an answer because god told you yes if god told you yes it doesn't matter what man woman child nation country says no god's yes is a yes god's yes is yes and amen it's fixed it's certain there's no way it won't happen the only way it won't happen is if we quit and we press through and we press through with confidence we press through knowing that god told me to do this the thing that i just referred to i'm not going to go into the details of it i know god put it in me i'm not going to take no for an answer there's another way around this thing maybe 
the the opposite the the resistance that comes maybe it was good it didn't go through the first time because you weren't exactly ready you had to shore up a few other things you had to come around a different way but if god has told you yes it doesn't matter what man says no man can oppose you god opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble if you're humbly pursuing the will of god I know my spirit is the candle of the Lord, and I want to display what God put in me when he knew me before he formed me in my mother's womb. No devil from hell can stop me. People always say no devil in hell. The devil ain't in hell. The demons ain't in hell. They're here, and they're trying to stop you from fulfilling God's mission for your life because they know that when, see, I, 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 I taught a little bit about this around Christmas time. That when the enemy doesn't know your future, okay? The demonic realm, uh, the devil is not omniscient, meaning all-knowing. He's a created being. He doesn't know everything. But what he does respond to is activity in the heavenlies. And so when you're asking, 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 seeking, 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 knocking, 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 and there's, there's a flurry of activity because the angels that you're asking according to God's will for your life, there is then activity because Psalm 103 verse 20, the angels hearken unto the voice of the word. And when you're speaking the word and you're, you're acting on a principle of the word, there's a flurry of activity in the heavenlies. The ministering spirits are going, the warring spirits are going and they're making room. And so the, uh, just like, Flies are attracted to certain things that the demons are attracted to the activity. They don't know what's going on, but they're going to go and try and stop it because if they, because if the angels are working on it, they want to try and stop it. So when you decide to go forward and you, whoa, some resistance, whoa, some resistance, huh? <laughs> must be doing something right. Never, 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 never let opposition scare you off if you're a christian and you're not encountering opposition i wonder if you're doing anything yes i'll say it again if you're a christian and you're not encountering opposition i wonder if you're doing anything i wonder if you're hearing from god because the enemy wants to stop you and he'll take any form that he possibly can to keep you from accomplishing God's purpose in your life. How powerful is this? How many of you needed to hear this today? I see Mary said, thank you. I need to hear that. There will always be that. Just another day. That statement that you don't, well, I don't want to confess that. It's just truth. That the bigger the levels, the higher the levels, the bigger the devils. Because there's hierarchy in the enemy's kingdom as well. And when you start to come up on something and, man, I'm feeling resistance. Ooh, you've come up on a vault. You're about to open something incredible. And the enemy's fighting you. The enemy's fighting. But I read in a really good book somewhere, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. I read it elsewhere in a really good book that no weapon formed against me can prosper. Press your plea. You may have heard of a guy named Daniel. Daniel prayed and fasted for 21 days. And the angel of the Lord came on the 21st day and said, I was opposed by the prince of Persia. What's that? That's, an high, that's a high level principality, level of demons. So he said, from the moment that you prayed, your prayer was answered. Because we understand that Jeremiah 33, 3 is true. Call unto me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you've not seen. That you've not known. He said it. You just ask. Jesus said ask. It's in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Whew. 
Tila. Verse uh, 6 to 11. Look at this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? <laughs> when will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Go to the ant, go to the ant, go to the ant. Man, the last couple days, we've had an infiltration in our kitchen, and then I'm seeing elsewhere those little, little tiny ants. Man. They get, and then it starts, I mean, what in the world? All of a sudden, and I saw one this morning by my, by the coffee pot, carrying a little piece of food. What in the world is going on? But what is that? We had a book when I was a kid, and it was called Character Sketches. Character Sketches. And in that it was a big book like this, big, heavy, hardbound book, thick like that. And in that book were different um, descriptions of animals and then tying together their attributes and how and godly uh, principles with the attributes of the owl or the or the eagle or the ant or the this or that and the other. And of you know, it's a lot of value when you look at stuff like that and the character sketches that it, it presents. Essentially, that's what those verses are that we just read. I mean, all of them, but specifically verse 6 to 11, it's about your character. Showcasing the ant and its diligence, contrasting and putting in a very good light, the ant, and a very poor light, the sluggard. Because the sluggard's like a sloth. They move about like this. You can barely even tell that my hand is moving because it's moving so slow. So, but an ant, man, those things go. They are not sleepy. There's a note about the sluggard here in my study Bible. It says a sluggard is a lazy individual who refuses to work and whose desires are not met. It's one who creates excuses to avoid work. And it says in, in uh, Proverbs 26, it gives several of those excuses. It says in Proverbs 26, 13, it says, The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in his dish. In the dish, he's too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. The sluggard... A lazy individual who refuses to work, who won't work, the sluggard says, how long will you lie there? When will you get up? If you don't, poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. So again, that harkens back to what we already talked about about our response ability to our responsibility to sit all day playing xbox and smoking weed and collecting a check probably not god's design for the human race might you agree maybe there's something sinister about paying people not to work. Hmm. People working their keisters off with how many jobs and then folks sitting at home 
collecting money. That, that, that's a whole that's a whole other whole other thing. But we were meant to be diligent. Diligence produces wealth. Diligence, consistency. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Keep right. Keep right. Keep doing the right thing. Well, I haven't seen the results yet. Well, you haven't gotten to the end of that yet. Apparently, if, if you haven't seen the results yet, it ain't over. It ain't over to, until you hear a large obese woman warming up backstage. <laughs> you know, the older day, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. No, it ain't over. If you haven't seen the the uh, the results that you're looking for, not over. You keep at it. Diligence. Diligent, diligent, diligent. Throughout the book of Proverbs, diligence is praised as consistent effort, keeping right. You know, we talked about that previously. Keep right. Don't deviate. Don't get off the track. And when you keep right and you stay on the path, you will arrive at your the destination that you punched in. The resistance? <laughs> oh, come on. Keep going. Diligent. Not sitting there creating excuses. The sluggard creates excuses. We talked about it yesterday that the sluggard is the kind of one that, that kind of lives in that victimized mentality. Victimhood. It's everybody else's fault. Uh, there's a there's a lion in the streets. A fierce lion roaming. Uh-huh. Yeah. Why don't you channel some of that creativity that you've been creating excuses with to how you can get your hiney out of bed and go to work and do what you're and and here here is the thing what god made us to do that whatever your hand finds to do do it with all of your might give your all to it and there's there's fulfillment when you give yourself to what you know you're good at as the old saying it says if you find a way to to make money doing what you're good at you'll never work a day in your life that is in line with the purpose of god you're not meant to be a slave to uh something given all of your time to something that you hate all of your life pay attention to what's on the inside and what god anointed you to do the good works that he prepared in advance for you to do and look for creative ideas on how to make that a source of income and creating a multiple stream of income so that I then am a multiple stream of blessing to all those that are around me. That I don't have needs, I meet needs. That I am a source of if something needs to be done, you can look to me and I'll look to pay for it. Because God has blessed me and I don't even feel it leave. Thank you, God, that you allow us to have all our needs are met. We're out of debt and there's plenty more to send out the door. That having that type of mentality that I want to be a distribution channel to bless others, to bless my family, to bless my friends, to bless complete strangers, to feed uh, children that their only meal of the day we feed children every month that often it's the only meal they get and they get taught about Jesus that I want to be a bright and shining candle of the Lord that response ability staying away from from people like the next few verses described Verse 12, 15, describe a slime ball. You don't want to be a scoundrel and a villain and who signaling with the feet and all that garbage. Stay away from that kind of stuff. And then the next verses describe things that the Lord hates, things to avoid at all costs. Stay away from them. And then verse 20 to 35, stay diligent. Keep right. Stay on the path. Keep. Don't stop. 
believing. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop. Yeah, don't. Just stay. Don't stop. Stay. Stay on the path. If you're off the path, get back on the path. If you've fallen off the horse, get back on the horse. If you've for forgotten how to ride a bike, get on. it. You have muscle memory. Get back on the bike and start riding again. God has called every single one of us to fulfill a very important task, tasks in this period of time. That truly the story of Esther is a great template for our tune-ups on a regular basis. That X, or Esther 4.14 says, who knows, but you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. What a glorious time to be alive that I've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. That irregardless of any, any resistance or opposition that comes against, I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to keep right because better life is ahead. I'm going to keep going forward, having the understanding that better life is ahead, knowing that ahead of me, that there's good stuff, knowing that if I stay on the track, that life and life more abundantly is not if, it's when. It's not if, it's when. It's not if, it's when. So your life and my life as we stay on the track, keep tuning ourselves up. Don't stop believing. Believe that prosperity is not for everybody else, but it's for you too. Believe that prosperity is inevitable if you stay diligent. Stay out of the sluggard lane. Stay in the Stay in the diligent lane and fulfill the purpose that God has created us for. You'll be very, very, very thrilled for all of eternity that you did. And even more important than you being thrilled all the way, you'll be pleasing the one who put you in that position to begin with. But God will look at you and say, like he's like the father said of his son after he was baptized, this is my beloved. And I'm well pleased. You long to hear the words from Jesus when you're staring in his eyes. And he says, well, God, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your reward. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that reward is part of our future. We choose to be the people that take serious our responsibilities by giving our all of our abilities. Lord, I pray for each of us, whatever's on our plate in regard to our spirit, mind, and body, in regard to our relationships, regard to our families, friendships, regard to business associates, regard to our careers, our finances, in regard to our creativity, in regard to our inventiveness, in regard to fun and adventure in every area of our lives. You are our set point. You are our destination. You are our target. You are the one to whom we offer our lives. Take our lives today, Lord God. Use us for your glory. May it never be that we should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, declaring that Lord that set us on fire and watch us burn. Let us be that light in darkness that we have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this hour, right here, right now. And I thank you, Lord, that you've anointed us to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that have been bound, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty to the captives. Thank you for the oil of joy for mourning, 
the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lord, for all of the things that you've provided. We choose to be distribution channels. We receive it for ourselves and we distribute it to all these things to others. We are indeed your workmanship, your work of art created in you to do good works that are already set up and waiting on us to say yes. So I'm telling you today, I say yes. As for me and my house, we will serve you, Lord. We will give of all that we have to be in service of our king, our master, our creator, our God, the one who knows the end before the beginning. We will follow your lead because you know all things. You know everything. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you for guiding us into all truth, showing us how to create a better mousetrap, so to speak. If we keep encountering no in opposition, I thank you for witty inventions to be able to know how to go forward with the plan and the purpose that you've put into us and that we've been pursuing. I thank you, Lord, for rivers in the desert and streams in the wasteland. I thank you for connections in every direction. I thank you, Lord, for the houses we didn't build and the vineyards we didn't plant. Thank you for the olive groves and the fruit trees in abundance. Thank you, Lord, that our houses are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Thank you, Lord God, that you allow us to go forward creating wealth in every direction and distributing blessings. Every person we come in contact with is blessed by us because we are blessed to be a blessing. I thank you, Lord, that you have made covenant with us and we fulfill our end of the bargain. When Jesus, you said, walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. We choose to walk with you and to work with you all the days of our lives, creating unforced rhythms of grace in our lives and for all those whom we will influence and impact. We thank you for it, Lord. We trust you. Our times are in your hands. Hope is in you. Our hope will never be cut off. We will never be disappointed. And we who hope in you, oh, that's right. We're the just that the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for. We're the ones that we who hope in you, we inherit the land. I thank you for prosperity and new territory being evidenced today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Y'all are wonderful people. Life's only getting better. And the reason why is because you are getting better at life. Have an incredible weekend. I'll see you.